Now we introduce the concept of centroid which is usually defined as the geometric center of a plane figure or a solid figure, but it has an important role in the study of forces acting on rigid bodies as well. First, let us consider the simplest idealized rigid system, the rigid rotor. It is the model of a rotating dumbbell that consists of two solid spheres connected with a rigid stick holding them a fixed distance apart. We approximate the spheres by the point masses M1 and M2 at their centers P1 and P2, and assume that the mass of the stick is negligible. The gravitational forces acting on this system are given by the weights G1 and G2 of the two point masses, which are equal to the mass M1 times the gravitational acceleration G and the mass M2 times the acceleration vector G, respectively. The weights G1 and G2 point downward towards the center of Earth, but the lines of action of the two forces can be considered parallel over a short distance determined by the size of the rigid rotor. We have already shown that these parallel planar forces can be replaced by their resultant force capital G, that is the vector sum of G1 and G2, where the magnitude of capital G is equal to the sum of the masses M1 and M2 times the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration G. We also saw that the line of action of the resultant force passing through the section P1 P2 at the point C is parallel with the lines of actions of the two forces, and its distance from them is given by the equation stating that the ratio of the distance D1 between the points P1 and C to the distance D2 between the points P2 and C is equal to the ratio of the magnitudes of the two forces, that is the ratio of the mass 2 to the mass M1. This relation between the two fractions can also be written as the equation stating that M1 times D1 is equal to M2 times D2. By applying the theorem of transmissibility, we can translate the point of application C of the resultant force along its line of action. In other words, the point of application can be any point in the stick along the line of action of the force G. However, if we rotate the body and change its orientation, the line of action of the force still passes through the point C. The point C can therefore be considered as the point of application of the weight G of the body, and we call it the centroid of the rigid rotor. We can generalize this method for any rigid body in a homogeneous gravitational field because the gravitational forces acting on the particles of the body are parallel with each other and they can be reduced to a single force, the weight G of the body. Then the centroid of a rigid body introduced most likely by Archimedes, is the point where the line of the action of the weight G always passes through, regardless of the orientation of the body. If a rigid body is supported at its centroid then the effect of the weight G of the body is compensated by the constrained force due to the support. In other words, a rigid body supported at its centroid is in equilibrium under the influence of gravity, regardless of the orientation of the body. We already demonstrated that the net torque produced by the forces acting on a body vanishes if the body is in equilibrium. Therefore, the torque acting on a rigid body produced by its own weight vanishes with respect to its centroid, regardless of the orientation of the body. In order to determine the centroid of a relatively small body, we can apply the method where we first suspend the body at a point P1 from a wire, then we suspend it at another point P2. In both the cases the body is in equilibrium, in which the vertical lines M1 and M2 called medians passing through the point of suspension also pass through the centroid C of the body. Otherwise the torques produced by the weight G acting at the point C with respect to the points P1 and P2 did not vanish, and the body were not in equilibrium. Then the centroid C of the body is the point of intersection of the medians M1 and M2 determined by suspending the body at its two different points P1 and P2. In many cases we can determine the centroid of homogeneous bodies based on their symmetry properties. For example, in the case of a homogeneous thin rod, disc, annulus in a plane or torus in space, sphere or cylinder, the centroid is the geometric center of the body. As the example of the annulus or the torus shows, the centroid of the body is not necessarily located in the body. Generally, if a homogeneous body is symmetric about a plane, a line or a point, then the centroid is in the symmetry plane, on the symmetry line or at the symmetry point. If the body has more than one symmetry planes or symmetry lines, then the centroid lies on the line of intersection of these planes or at the point of intersection of these lines. For example, the centroid of a homogeneous triangle is the point of intersection of its three medians connecting the vertices of the triangle to the midpoints of the opposite sides. We saw that the method used to determine the centroid of a rigid rotor can also be applied in the case of solid bodies. Now we generalize this method for rigid bodies of whatever shape, with no symmetry at all. Let us consider a rigid body that consists of the endpoints masses M1, M2, ellipsis, Mn. For the sake of simplicity, we show only the first three's point masses in this system and omit the rigid sticks holding them fixed distances apart. We can construct the centroid of this rigid system of point masses by repeating the method applied for the rigid rotor. 
First we determine the centroid C sub 1 2 of the point masses M1 and M2, then we combine these point masses into the point mass M1 plus M2 at their centroid. The position of the point C sub 1 2 lying on the line section connecting the point masses M1 and M2 is determined by the equation stating that the mass M1 times the distance D1 between the point mass M1 and the centroid is equal to the mass M2 times the distance D2 between the point mass M2 and the centroid. In the second step we determine the centroid C sub 1 2 3 of the combined point mass and the point mass M3, and we combine them into the point mass M1 plus M2 plus M3 at the centroid C sub 1 2 3. Then the equation determining the position of the centroid on the line section connecting the combined point mass M1 plus M2 at the point C sub 1 2 and the point mass M3 is the following. The sum of the masses M1 and M2 times the distance D sub 1 2 between the point C sub 1 2 and the point C sub 1 2 3 is equal to the mass M3 times the distance D3 between the point mass M3 and the centroid C sub 1 2 3. We can continue this procedure for the rest of the rigid system of point masses and determine the centroid of the whole system. For a given reference point O, the set of position vectors R1, R2, ellipsis, Rn describe the positions of the point masses in the system. Let R sub 1 2 denote the position vector of the centroid C sub 1 2, where the lengths of the vectors are sub 1 2 minus R1 and R2 minus R sub 1 2 give the distances D1 and D2 respectively. Then we can write the first equation under the figure in the form stating that the mass M1 times the difference between the vectors R sub 1 2 and R1, is equal to the mass M2 times the difference between the vectors R2 and R sub 1 2. We can use the vector equation instead of its scalar projection because the vectors are sub 1 2 minus R1 and R2 minus R sub 1 2 have the same direction. By removing the parentheses and transposing the negative terms to the opposite sides of the equation, we obtain the expression stating that M1 times R sub 1 2 plus M2 times R sub 1 2 is equal to M1 times R1 plus M2 times R2. Now we can express the position vector of the centroid C sub 1 2 as the sum of M1 times R1 and M2 times R2, divided by the sum of M1 and M2. We can follow the same procedure for the second step. If R sub 1 2 3 denotes the position vector of the centroid C sub 1 2 3, then the lengths of the vectors are sub 1 2 3 minus R sub 1 2 and R 3 minus R sub 1 2 3 give the distances D sub 1 2 and D 3 respectively. We can apply this notation and write the second equation under the figure in the following form. The combined mass M1 plus M2 times the difference between the position vectors are sub 1 2 3 and R sub 1 2 is equal to the mass M2 times the difference between the position vectors R3 and R sub 1 2 3. By removing the parentheses and transposing the terms with the negative sign to the opposite side of the equation, we obtain an equation stating that the sum of M1 and M2 times R sub 1 2 3, plus M3 times R sub 1 2 3 is equal to the sum of M1 and M2 times R sub 1 2, plus M3 times R3. Now we substitute R sub 1 2 obtained in the previous step into this equation, and express R sub 1 2 3 from it. As a result, the position vector of the centroid C sub 1 2 3 can be written as the sum of M1 times R1, M2 times R2 and M3 times R3, divided by the sum of M1, M2 and M3. If we continue this iterative procedure for the rest of the point masses in the system, we can determine the position vector or C of the centroid for the rigid system of the point masses M1, M2, ellipsis, Mn at the points given by the position vectors R1, R2, ellipsis, Rn with respect to the reference point O. Then the centroid RC can be written as the sum of the mass Mi times the position vector Ri from I equals 1 to N, divided by the sum of Mi from I equals to N. Since the sum in the denominator gives the total mass M of the rigid system, the position of the centroid is given by 1 over the total mass M, times the sum of the mass Mi times the position vector Ri from I equals 1 to N. In order to provide a quantitative description of the position of the centroid of a system of point masses, we introduce a Cartesian coordinate system having its origin at the reference point O, and represent the position vector Ri of any point mass Mi in the system by the Cartesian coordinates Xi, Yi and Zi. Then the coordinate expansion of the vector equation describing the position vector or C of the centroid C gives three component equations. The x-coordinate of the centroid is equal to 1 over the total mass M of the system times the sum of the mass mi times the coordinate xi from i equals 1 to n. We have similar equations for the y and z components of the centroid as well. The vector and the component equations define the centroid of a system of point masses even if the point masses have no rigid connections with each other. 
Although the three component equations of the centroid depend on the coordinates of the point masses, it is evident from the first part of the iterative construction method without using any reference point and coordinate system that the position of the centroid of the system with respect to the system itself is independent of the choice of the coordinate system. The position of the centroid of a system of point masses or a rigid body is completely determined by the distribution of the mass in the system or over the volume of the body. In the general case when the distribution of mass is arbitrary, we will therefore call the centroid the center of mass of a system of point masses or a rigid body. Then the centroid is equivalent to the geometric center of a body, whereas its center of mass is defined by the equations obtained for the position vector or C and its coordinates. For homogeneous bodies or point masses arranged in a symmetric manner, the centroid is the same of the center of mass. In this example we consider four point masses M at the corners of a square. Due to the symmetry of the distribution of this arrangement the center of mass of the system is at the geometric center C of the square, that is the center of mass of the system and the centroid of the square coincide. However, if we double the mass of the point masses at the lower left and right corners of the square, the center of mass C M of the system is no longer at the centroid C of the square. CM will be located at a point on the vertical axis of symmetry of the square that is closer to the more massive point masses. We can also determine the center of gravity of a system of point masses if we combine the weights of the point masses instead of their masses at their center in each step of the iterative method. Then the position vector or C describing the center of gravity is given by the sum of the magnitude of the weight GI of the point mass MI, times the position vector RI of the point mass from I equals 1 to N divided by the magnitude of the total weight g of the system of the point masses. Here the magnitude of the weight g i is equal to the mass m i times the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration g, and capital G denotes the total weight of the system, that is the product of its total mass m and the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration g. As a result, while the center of mass of a rigid body is independent of gravity, the center of gravity depends on the gravitational field acting on the body. As opposed to a system of individual point masses, ordinary bodies have continuous distribution of mass which can be either homogeneous or inhomogeneous. In order to determine the center of mass C M of a rigid body, we break up the body into n volume elements delta V i, where I denotes the position vector of the volume element delta V i with respect to a reference point O. The mass element delta M i is equal to the mass of the matter in the volume element of body with a continuous distribution of mass. Then we can apply the formula derived for a system of point masses and approximate the center of mass or C of the body with the sum of the position vector R I times the mass delta M I from I equals 1 to N, divided by the sum of delta M I from I equals 1 to N. Since the density rho I of the matter in the volume element delta V I is given by the ratio of delta M I to delta V I, we can express delta M I as the product of rho I and delta V I. The center of mass or C of the body can therefore be approximated with the sum of rho I times R I times delta V I from I equals 1 to N, divided by the sum of rho I times delta V I from I equals 1 to N. If delta V I tends to zero while the number N of the volume elements approaches infinity, the limit of each sum in the fraction gives a volume integral over the volume of the body. As a result, the position vector or C of the center of mass of a rigid body that has a density rho depending on the position vector R, is given by the volume integral of the density rho times the position vector R with respect to the reference point R over the volume integral of the density rho. Here the integral of the density rho over the total volume of the body gives the total mass M of the body, and the position vector R C can be written as 1 over the mass M times the volume integral of the density rho times the position vector R. If we attach a Cartesian coordinate system to the reference point O, we can express the x coordinate of the center of mass by 1 over the mass m times the volume integral of the density rho times the x coordinate. We have similar equations for the other two Cartesian coordinates as well. As an example, let us determine the center of mass for a homogeneous right circular cone with the radius of its base r and height h. Since the conic solid is homogeneous, its density rho is constant. We attach a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system to the vertex of the cone such that its x-axis coincides the symmetry axis of the cone, and its y-axis is parallel with the base of the cone. Due to the symmetry and the homogeneity of the cone, its center of mass must locate it at its axis of symmetry, that is the y and z coordinates of the center of mass vanish. Then we only need to compute the x-coordinate of the center of mass of the cone. By applying the volume integral of rho times x over the mass m of the cone obtained for the coordinate xc, we can determine the position of the center of mass on the x-axis. Let us consider a disk that has the radius y and the infinitesimal width dx at the distance x from the vertex, as seen in the figure. 
Such a disk parallel with the base of the cone is an infinitesimal volume element dv of the cone given by the area of its base times its width, that is y squared times pi times dx. The figure shows that the ratio of y to x is equal to the ratio of r to h, and y squared can be expressed as the square of the ratio of x times r to h. Then the volume element dv is given by the ratio of r squared times pi to h squared, times x squared times dx. If we substitute this expression into the volume integral over the whole cone then we can transform it into an integral with respect to the x-coordinate from 0 to the height h of the cone. As a result, the coordinate xc is equal to 1 over m times rho times the ratio of r squared times pi to h squared, times the integral of x cubed with respect to x from 0 to h. By performing the integration we obtain h to the 4th over 4, and we can write the right-hand side in as 1 over m times rho times the ratio of r squared times pi times h to 3, times 3 times h over 4. Since the ratio of r squared times pi times h to 3 is equal to the total volume v of the cone, and the density rho times the volume v gives the mass m of the solid body, the x-coordinate of the center of mass of the homogeneous cone is given by 3 over 4 times the height h of the cone. We immediately see from this calculation that an inhomogeneous cone may have a different center of mass. For example, if the density of the solid is proportional to the x-coordinate, that is the density is given by rho times x, then we need to integrate x to the fourth power instead of x cubed which gives h to the 5 over 5. Then the final result is equal to 3 over 5 times h squared instead of 3 over 4 times h obtained for the homogeneous cone. Further properties of the center of mass can also be presented demonstrating the usefulness of this concept in the dynamics and statics of rigid bodies. We have already seen that the weight capital G of a rigid body has a line of action that always passes through the centroid or the center of mass C of the body. Here the weight capital G is given by the mass M of the body times the gravitational acceleration G. As a result, the center of mass of a rigid body of weight M times G can be considered as the point of application of the gravitational force M times G, irrespective to the orientation of the body. By supporting a rigid body at its center of mass, we compensate its weight that is the gravitational force acting at this point, and the body will be in equilibrium. These properties of the center of mass are very important if we want to determine the work done by the gravitational force because a rigid body of mass m can be replaced by a point mass m located at the center of mass of the body. If we suppose that the vertical position of the center of mass C of a rigid body is increased by the height delta H, we can express the work W done against the gravitational force that is the increase in the potential energy of the body delta E pot as the mass M of the body times the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration times delta H. We also saw that the torque due to the weight of a rigid body vanishes with respect to its centroid or center of mass and does not rotate the body. If the body is supported at its center of mass but it is free to rotate, then we can determine the axis about which the rigid body will rotate under the influence of a force couple. We already presented an experiment where a board is placed on three balls of the same size such that the balls rolling on the floor allow the board to move horizontally. If we apply the force couple F and minus F on the board at the points P1 and P2 then the board will rotate in the horizontal plane, and we can demonstrate that the vertical line passing through the center of mass of the board is the axis of rotation. In general, a force couple applied on a free rigid body will rotate the body about an axis passing through the center of mass of the body, but the direction of the rotation depends on both the torque due to the force couple and the distribution of matter in the body.